Well, good morning. Welcome back. It's so great to have you with us. We have an incredible pre-service presentation, and then we're going to worship God together at 1030. But uh, right now, I want to share a scripture with you in James 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Those trials are real, especially during this pandemic. And I want to encourage everybody to consider why this is the best thing that could possibly happen to you. I know for me, even based on that wonderful scripture, it says that these things produce testing of our faith, which is going to show a perseverance. And I'm so grateful because I felt that testing and I'm sure many of you have as well. And I'm so grateful that God is more real to me today than when this pandemic began. That is a beautiful thing. Don't you think, honey? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, human reasoning would say, oh my gosh, this has turned my world upside down. Uh, I'm, I'm scared. Fear has been uh, exposed in many areas of all of our lives, us too. But God says that's why he came and that's why he died on the cross and that's why he raised from the dead and that's why he calls us to him, to have faith and trust in him in these times. So that's why he says when challenges and trials come, he allowed or caused the coronavirus to come. It doesn't mean he approved of it, but he allowed it to come for us to look at it as an opportunity for joy. Why? to go to God, because nothing, nothing is foolproof on this planet except God. Right. Every one of us are fragile human beings, and if you really look at the reality around you, what do you put your trust in? Right. Nothing is foolproof. Yeah, and I know that, you know, we cannot control the events and circumstances that come our way. Certainly none of us would have said two months ago that coronavirus would have shut down the world. However, we can control our response to the events and circumstances. And so I just want to encourage you as you're joining us today to open wide your mind and your heart to focus on things above and know that God has a plan and He's working His plan. And that plan can be personal for you if you allow Him to make it personal. So uh, I, we just want to say hello and let you know that uh, we are going to have an incredible presentation and a service. So right now, go get what you want to drink, go set up your communion, up elements. Your communion elements, get ready to really uh, buckle in, and we'll be back in a few moments. See you soon.
Welcome back, everybody. I just want to take a moment to honor all of our wonderful, incredible healthcare workers. We know and appreciate that you are putting your life on the line every time you go to work, while many of us are staying at home, and that's our contribution. A whole lot easier than what you're doing right there out on the front lines of this pandemic. So thank you so much. You are heroes to us, and we honor you for what you're doing. So uh, we are excited to share with you a skit we came up with last week called Corona-itis. And uh, this 
came about by the way that we can all react to completely incredibly extraordinary situations like a pandemic. And it's and all of us have reacted in different ways and many of the same ways and it produces anxiety, fear, uh, being annoyed, especially the stay home order, all of us together. So like my wife said, this is a serious issue, but I do believe comedy yes. uh, is healing. So it's in no way making light of any of the serious things that happen, but it is a way to hopefully see between the lines uh, how we can trust God and then laugh at ourselves as well. So at this time, I want to uh, present to you Corona Itis, and then we have the premiere immediately following of our episode two. So enjoy. Enjoy. Even greater things that have been done before. Take what we have done and make it. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. You know that I'm a hard fighting Honey! Honey! Did you hear what's happening? I can't believe it. There's a. The government, the governor, there's, it's all over the news. Why are you so excited? We have to stay in. They just gave the whole nation a stay home and order. We can't go out. What? That we can't go out. This is insane. The coronavirus, they said, is moving. Yeah, do we got enough toilet paper? Oh, gosh darn, great job. You got it. When did you get all this? This is great, but we probably need to get more. Listen, this is very serious. You know why? Because we might not think it is, but if we don't stay focused spiritually, we are not going to be able to keep our minds self-controlled. And I'm just telling you, idle time is a devil's workshop. That's one of your favorite things. stay at home and we can't have service? No, we got to figure that out. We got to have it on like, uh, uh, I got to call Devon and see what we got to do. I don't even know all that stuff, but we got to be able to communicate. Yeah, there's a lot going on. What about times to have people over for hospitality? No, no, not unless you want to get the coronavirus. In fact, you got to stay away right now. We, we got to make sure you got to get tested. Listen, we're going to go nuts if we don't stay. Listen, if we don't stay focused, we're going to go nuts. We can't just take it for granted. Let me show you something right here. This is uh, uh, self-control. I talk about it a lot, but now the game is on. It's game on. Check, because when we have time to do anything, anytime, we're going to take for granted to do quiet times because you're gonna go, I can do it anytime. We gotta stay focused because the Bible, the Word of God is what's gonna continue our keeping our minds and uh, giving us the strength. Look what it says in Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, there it is, and self-control, self-control. Wow, because think about it. Everybody's going to be at home. They can do their quiet time anytime they want. And you know what happens? If you don't get up and do this first, you're going to slowly slip into lukewarmness or even worse, just debauchery. Yes. So we just watching need to get both. Watching too many so, movies, watching Netflix all day. That's right. Eating too much. That's right. That could be a problem. That could be a big fat boy problem. So I tell you right now that I'm going to start out and get focused right now. So I'm going to read a little bit right now with my relationship with God. So can you go do yours and then we can pray together. Yes, love. Okay. I love God more than you, but that's because I need to be a good husband. So this is serious. Lord, I'm a fighting soldier on the battlefield. I keep on
But because of your stubbornness and your repentant heart, well, that's me. You may ask yourself, what in the world is going on? Well, well, let me tell you something. The battle is real and always on. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anybody can get caught in sin if you're not careful, especially in a pandemic. So like I've always said, if the pandemic doesn't get to you, stay at home, Will. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Hey, Dad, we're going to be filming the sermon right now, so can you just be quiet if you come out in the kitchen because we're going to shoot, okay? All right, I appreciate it. Thanks. Some of us may not even realize it, myself included, till I really God got my attention, was that I was showing contempt for the riches of God's kindness by disrespecting Devon, you help, help me with this darn thing. Driving me nuts. And willful sin that literally Thank you, killed Lord. Jesus. And, and also, basically oh, what I was saying well, is today I, I got a cross, pal. I'm not ready. But tell I really owned it and said, I killed Jesus by my sin. You're killing Jesus by your sin. That's when you have to really decide to do the because when you really realize he has to take your place, he has to be beaten, tortured, and died for you not to be separated from God. And when you understand that, that he's saving your spiritual eternal life from hell, you're going to change. If you don't change, then it's foolishness and it's become a ritual and you're religious in a way that has no meaning. You honor him with your lips, but your heart's far from him, and you just go to the church that your ancestors went to. And everybody just goes along, puts on the church face and goes home, but has no idea of anything else. And we all think we're a good people. We're not. God says no one's good compared to the standard. No one can make it into heaven by living a good moral life without Jesus. Does that make sense? Verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and your repentant heart, You are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath.
Well, a picture does speak a thousand words. That was funny. Thank you, honey. I have just one question. What was with the pen? Well, I'm so glad you asked. In Ephesians <laughs> chapter 4, verse 26, it says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil foothold. Yeah. This pen here, I was preaching the word last week with this pen. And I got frustrated and annoyed at some things that were going on when I was trying to preach. And I just lost it and threw the pen in the other room toward the people to try to get their attention. And uh, that was real footage that you saw. That was actually the real footage that we just showed because after I, when I really did it, I said, God, I'm sorry mentally, because I was preaching. I was like, God, I can't believe this. But in my mind, I said, forgive me. Yeah. And I kept preaching. And then after the sermon, I immediately went and apologized uh, to the people. Amen. And and I said, and then, I, then we cut that out because we don't want to be fake. But I realized later, I said, you know what? That's real. Yeah. And we like to be real. We like to Amen. keep it real because I don't make, I don't, I don't strive to use grace as an excuse to sin, but mm -hmm. man, I, I have to say as a, I'm preaching the word, I, I lost my temper frustration wise. And I penned in my anger. So that pen sailing, I figured we can stimulate people and realize that we can sin in our anger almost because of anything. Yes. So if anything, yes. instead of hiding it or faking like it's okay, that's why Jesus died. Be strong in the grace. It's not an excuse. But when it happens, don't hide it. Amen. Be you and take responsibility. So here we go. Thank you for being open. Uh, Sorry. Uh, that's what happened. So I used uh, uh, repentance to make a funny show. So Amen. right now, we're going to start the five-minute countdown. Yes. And then let's worship God together. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.
May I have your attention, please? Worship will be starting in one minute. Please take this opportunity to prepare your hearts for worship and to be seated. And don't forget to put your cell phones on silent. wife Larcy. So today we have the amazing opportunity to do the welcome for you guys today. Okay, so if you could with me, could you turn to Matthew 6 34 and it reads, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And as we all may know, the COVID virus is still among us. But regardless of the situation at hand, we found a new temporary way to worship God as a family. So we may not know what tomorrow may bring, but we know today we have this opportunity to worship God. And with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to my beautiful wife to share. Good morning, family. I want to give a special good morning to the women. I know a lot has been going on with COVID-19, and some of us are facing new challenges because of it. Like those of us who are extroverts who no longer have the ability to go out, socialize, or meet new people, or even some of us who unfortunately lost our jobs during this hard time. So now the worry of financial survival is becoming an obstacle too. But I love the scripture in Matthew because in Matthew, it teaches us to not give in to worry and to also not to dwell on the difficult times that we're facing. Sometimes we can become so caught up in the uncertainty of our future that we lose the precious time of the now. And what is happening now is that even though we're unable to meet physically, God has opened the door for us to connect and worship him virtually with each other. So I want to encourage you to not give in to worry and to always remember that with God's will, there's always a way. And with that being said, we would like, like to welcome you to the Orlando International, International Christian Church. Church. And now we'll have our brother Chris pray for us. Well, good morning. Thanks, Wayne and Larcy. So as we get ready to pray uh, for the service to worship God, I hope you're excited to worship God. And I know it's not the usual circumstances, of course, we're in our homes. But I want to ask you not to be afraid to get up out of your couch and worship with all your heart when we sing and we praise God. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing, My Lord Heard Jerusalem. And let's really show our God how grateful we are. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for everything that you've given us, that you are going to give us. And Father, we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, you are our security. Father, we know that nothing can separate us from the love that you have for us, Father, not even death. Thank you so much for this time as we get ready to sing with all our hearts, God. Let us praise you. Please encourage us and, and, and deepen our faith, God. Thank you so much for being such a loving God and Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My Lord heard Jerusalem When she mourned, heard her when she mourned My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned her when she mourned oh when she mourned her when she mourned oh when she mourned her when she mourned 
Oh, when she mourned her, oh, when she mourned, oh, when she mourned her, oh, when she mourned, my Lord heard Jerusalem. Oh, when she mourned her, oh, when she mourned, my Lord heard Jerusalem. Oh, when she mourned her, oh, when she mourned, when she mourned her, oh, when she mourned. Well, some people don't believe in singing. singing. They say singing ain't cool. Well, now if you wanna get to heaven, heaven. you better crack a note. Baptizing, that ain't true. Well, well now if you want to get to heaven, heaven, you better stir the waters too. Jerusalem, oh, and she mourned her, and she mourned her, and she mourned Jerusalem, oh, and she mourned. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, her Jerusalem. My Lord, oh my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, her Jerusalem. She heard her. My Lord, oh my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, her Jerusalem. My Lord, her Jerusalem. Oh, when she mourned her. Jerusalem, when she mourned, heard her when she mourned, my Lord. I can hear the singing from your houses. Great job. So now we've come to the communion part of our service. This is the part where we reflect on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So to prepare our hearts today, we have Aisha Reese who's going to share about what the cross of Christ means to her. And before she does that, I'm going to ask us all to join in on a song called The Spirit's Fire. We need to know, we need your fire within. We need your love, we need you as our friend. We need your light to guide through what's ahead. Spirit's fire, almighty flame, calling us higher, never the same, burning our hearts, flow through our veins, the Spirit's fire.
Today, I have the honor of sharing with you what the cross means to me. I want to start off by sharing how I viewed life before I became a disciple. Growing up, I relied a lot on myself. I thought that I was in control. I was the one that made things happen with my hard work and perseverance. I was what got me where I was at the time. Um, with, you know, fighting with schools, grades, work. It was all me. But becoming a disciple, a new concept was introduced, the truth. And it was more like, did God do that? Or did I do that? And it's like, what do you mean? I, of course I did that. I was the one that put in all that hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. I was doing the physical manual labor. It was majority me. Fine, we can give them a little bit credit, but it was all me. So I want to share with you Proverbs 16, 9. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And that was so true for me. I realized that even though I had to face a lot of obstacles and a lot of roadblocks, it all had to do something with God's timing. If I would have finished school or gotten to the schools that I wanted, what I wanted, how I wanted, I wouldn't have been working where I was working and met the wonderful person that introduced me to the kingdom and that uh, was the one to really initiate this new journey. And I'm just so grateful to have the kingdom during this time, this whole COVID experience. I am a nurse and Facing what I have to face at work and just in life in general is, yeah, I just couldn't imagine. 
um, it has really been exposing my heart and putting my trust and faith to the true test. Um, at work, having to deal with families that are so upset because they can't see their loved ones. They're crying. They're looking for you to like make miracles happen. And you just stand there feeling helpless and just trying to console them the best that you can. And like the COVID patients cannot have visitors right now because of course we don't want them to spread it. But it's like then we go in there and we're that filler. We don't even know these people, you know, we're strangers. Of course they want their families. It's just heartbreaking to watch these things. Having to speak with family members on the phone, you can just hear the concern in their voice and they're just feeling so helpless. It's just really heartbreaking to see these things day in and day out. And then dealing with the team members, not feeling protected, being anxious about, um, are they putting their families at harm? What's gonna happen if they get sick? How are they gonna get paid? It's really a, a tough time right now to be in healthcare. And I just remember somebody asking me like, how do you deal with this <clears throat> every day? How do you face these changes and face the team members when they just come to you with all these concerns? And I said, literally, like I just deal with everything day by day and pray. That's literally all that I have throughout this time. Um, I want to share with you Matthew 634. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I never could really uh, relate to that until now. Like, you know, we always think about the past, a little bit into the future, but there's so much unknown right now. It's like you just, you think you got to figure it out and then boom, there's something else. Um, literally every day at work, there's new updates and changes. I mean, even now when it comes to the social distancing. First it was, we can have small groups, no more than 10 people. Then it was, we had a curfew. Then there was a social distancing order and that get extended after that was getting close to expiring. So it's just constantly evolving. With all these unknowns, all we really can do is just trust in God. And I just see that on so many different levels now. Uh, I noticed that I had a lot of distractions in my life, like being able to go here, there, hang out with this person, hang out with that person. And now I just have so much time to spend with God. And it's like, it's a really big eye opener for me. Um, I know one big thing that I was worried about was finances. Like I know that I still have a job and I know that they like put a lot of emphasis on healthcare, but at the same time, like our census is low, things are still changing for us. And I caught myself worried about the future, but then also feeling guilty for having a job still and still making money. And I just wanted to live in the now and be able to give back what I could now while I still have the finances to do that despite what the future may hold. So I did decide to take my income tax check and give it to missions so that we can help the people worldwide during this time because I know that we're all struggling one way or another. And I'd like to read final scripture found in James 3, 13 to 16. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show up by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. So this whole experience has really helped me grow in humility before God and to truly accept and acknowledge that God is in control and to just surrender to his plans and his timing for everything. Thank you, Aisha, for uh, sharing your heart about what the cross means. Let's all pray now as we get ready to take communion. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for really the continuous understanding that you give us of unconditional love through 
what your son did, Jesus, on the cross. We know that he came down and became a human being in every way and willingly continue to deny himself because of his love for each one of us in dying on the cross. Please, God, as we take the communion, please help us to be enriched and moved uh, and also know that there's nothing we can't be forgiven for if we don't bring, if we bring it before you in a humble way. And God, it's also a celebration because we also are remembering that you are going to come back. Thank you so much, God. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. So now we've come to the part of our service where we give our contribution. And this is for the Orlando International Church members. They've all made a pledge, a vow before God to really give and continue to advance the kingdom here in Orlando. If you are watching and you're looking in and you wish to give, we thank you in advance. And you can give at uh, Orlando ICC Cash App or go to our website, Orlando ICC, which is International Christian Church, uh, .org, and there's a donate uh, button, and we thank you so much in advance for helping us continue to advance the good news of Jesus Christ all through uh, Orlando and Florida. And now uh, I'm going to pass it to Diego, who is going to share about what giving means to him. Good morning, everyone. My name is Juan Diego Barrientos Sepulveda Gallo Sevilla, but most people just call me Diego for short. And this is our contribution part of our service. So I know it can be uh, tough financially on a lot of people right now, 
I know that for me, I got furlong two weeks ago, but I still have it in my heart to give because uh, I know that God will provide. Just like it says in Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So I know that God's never going to leave me. God is always going to be there when I need him in the easy times and the hard times. That is why it's in my heart to give, because I know God has given us so much, and I just want to keep helping God in any way. I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for the contribution in Orlando or the special missions to get Orlando planted beforehand. I really don't know where I would be, and I don't think I want to know, because I am happy being with God, and I want to keep giving to my heart's content. Um, I know not a lot of people plan for what is happening right now, but just because I don't have any income coming in, that's, that's, that's not going to stop me from giving to God, because it's in my heart, and I want to see other people be saved, just like I was, because I know that I was lost at one point, and I am glad that God has saved me, and I'm not going to stop giving my contribution no matter what happens. Because the Bible also says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So I know that God is going to take care of me no matter what happens. So that is why I continue to give. God will take care of me and God will provide for me. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be able to give for a contribution and special missions. Padre Dios, gracias por la oportunidad que nos has dado para dar nuestro contribución en las misiones especiales para ti so that we could help others that are lost in this world and they have a chance to see you and be safe para nosotros tener la oportunidad de ayudar a, a otros que están perdidos en este mundo y que tengan la oportunidad de estar salvos. Thank you for being there for us in the easy times and in the hard times. Gracias por estar ahí con nosotros en los tiempos fácil y los tiempos difíciles. We know that you will never leave us. Nosotros sabemos que tú nunca nos vas a dejar. Please help us continue to evangelize Orlando and the world with our contribution and special missions. Por favor, ayúdanos a seguir a predicar tu palabra en Orlando y en el resto del mundo con nuestra contribución aquí y las misiones especiales. So we could help anyone who really needs their help para nosotros poder ayudar a cualquier persona que en verdad necesita la ayuda. I know that I once was lost, but now I'm found, and I honestly don't know what I would be if it wasn't for you, the contribution people gave in Orlando, and the special missions people gave to plant Orlando. Y te doy gracias a ti, porque yo no sé dónde yo estuviera, si no fuera por, por ti, la contribución que los discípulos aquí dieron en Orlando y por las misiones especiales que los otros discípulos dieron para plantar Orlando. Thank you for everything and please be with the rest of the service. Gracias por todo y por favor esté con nosotros para el resto del servicio. In Jesus' name, en el nombre de Jesús. Amen.
Sometimes I feel that I can fight an army with just me and you, and there's no one good army. Oh, but sometimes I can feel a little shy. It's then I need to know that you are there. That's why I'm singing be with me, Lord. When I'm down, oh, and when I'm lonely, and when I'm tired, yeah, I need you only. excited to preach the word, uh, but before we do that, I need to say a prayer for the service, but I also want to include our very special brother, Fred DeGene. Um, as many of you know, his brother got in a serious truck accident from work, and I just want to pray for him, and Fred, our hearts go out to you and your family and we are praying for your brother. And at this time, we're gonna pray for him and the service. Dear Father, thank you so much, God, for being our God and our Father. God, please, I pray that you're with Fred's brother right now and his family. We know that life is such a fragile, precious gift. Uh, we know that uh, it really hurts when someone's suffering. And I just pray you wrap your arms around the Dejean family, be with uh, Letitia, uh, and God, I just pray, we know that you are always working. I just pray that every human being involved that's in the, around the situation and his brother, that they can really hear your voice and understand what you're doing. Thank you so much, God. I pray you're with me as I preach the word. Help us to understand that the only real security is our faith in you. We love you, God. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So the title of the lesson today is, Are You All Set? For life. Are you all set for life? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. You know, when someone gets ready to go on a trip or a vacation or a camping trip, you, uh, the people maybe that are, that are saying goodbye to them or the people that are getting ready to go with them, they say, are you all set, man? You got your stuff? Did you bring everything? And they may even remind you, did you pack your toothbrush, your extra pair of socks, you got your boots? Got your first aid kit, got your waterproof cover for your tent. But I'm asking you, are you all set for life? That's a question that really, if you think about it, it's almost impossible to answer if you're, because how would you know? You don't know what's coming. Well, let's read in Colossians chapter three, verse one. Since then, you've been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above, 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So we see here that Apostle Paul, carried by the Spirit of God to write this down, is saying, listen, those of us who have been raised with Christ, that means those of us who have repented, were baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, received the gift of the Spirit, and were, were added to the number to, and written in the book of life, as in Acts 2.38 says, we've been raised with Christ. We still have our sin for nature, but because of what Jesus did, our sins are forgiven and our heart is changed and our direction and our way of life now is fully trusting Jesus as our Lord. And he says, man, since you've done that, the real genuine truth of your faith is now set your heart on things above, set your mind on things above. Let me tell you something. When you get up every day, if you don't focus on what you got to do for the day, time can go fast and you'll find that you got distracted, uh, procrastinated, and you really didn't have your mind set on what needed to happen in priority order. You got, when you wanted to get something done, you got you to set your mind and you got to set your heart. Your mind is the intellectual going, I'm going to do this and I've been thinking about it and planning it. And your heart is the passion and, and the willingness and understanding it's totally worth it. Even if it gets hard, I'm going to give 110%. And when he says that, it says set on things above. That means not earthly things. He says, you've died and your life is now hidden with Christ. That's interesting because, you know, setting your heart on things above means striving to put heaven's priorities into daily practice now while we're still on earth. We get our directions from Christ, not the culture or the pattern of this world around us. Setting our mind on things above means concentrating on the eternal rather than the temporal. Concentrating on the eternal rather than the temporary things. Uh, and then he says something that sometimes people can get confused at. It says in verse, uh, in, in the end of verse, between verse 2 and 3, it says, for you died. In verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. So when you are baptized into Christ, you participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. God says that when you die physically, the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead will also raise you up on the last day. But right now, you're still on the earth. Right now, you, uh, if you're a Christian, you're saved. And like I said, there's only two categories that God's word puts the human being in, either lost or saved. That means if you're lost, the whole goal for you is to come to your senses and a knowledge to realize that God created you to find him. There's nothing more important than to walk with him, get right with him, and trust him in this life, this short life. Uh, and if you're lost, uh, you need to see the meaninglessness in your life. But people can stay distracted for a long time. But when you, it says you died with them, it really means that we should have as little desire for the sinful worldly pleasures as a dead person would have. See, when someone's dead, they're not going to be doing anything more. So when we die with Christ, we die with our, to our sinful nature, which means that do you still have strong, sinful desires for the worldly pleasures that you know intellectually are sin and wrong, but you still want them? That should not be. You should be dying, and it should be less and less attractive. It doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with sin, but as you mature in the Lord, you'll see that it really has no value, and you'll actually even see through it that it's destructive. But the Christian's real Home is where Christ lives. Look in uh, John 14, 2. Look in John 14, 2. Because that's where we are going to be for the rest of our life. And since we received an inheritance that can never perish, fade, or, or disappear, 
we have a home in heaven. So let's look at what he says, because if we are set on things above with our mind and heart, that means we know that this life, live it to the full, but it's short. It's really short compared to eternal life. And if you look at here in verse uh, John chapter 14, verse 2, he says, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that, I'm, that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also uh, be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Yes, we do, because we died with, we died with Christ and now we have our hearts and our minds set on things above. That means we're walking and living for God. What does it mean in verse 3? If you go back to Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 3, it says here, uh, you know, uh, you're, you now died. Your life is now hidden with Christ and God. What does it mean to be hidden? Well, hidden means concealed and safe. You're set. When Jesus died and you by faith are saved in the blood of Jesus, you have been given the eternal life that cannot be taken from you because you really made Jesus Lord. You may fight, you may struggle, and we're going to talk about that, but you're going to die saved because your convictions of setting your heart and mind on things above cannot be moved. It can be shaken, but you will be strong in the grace. And, you know... Being hidden means concealed. You're safe. Nothing can hurt you. God is your protector. God either allows everything or causes everything. Uh, and this only ensures our future hope. It gives us the hope not only that we're going to go to heaven when we die, but it also gives us security right now. Do you have an inner security regardless of outside circumstances? And these are very unusual circumstances. I believe no matter what, God is my rock. God is my protector. God is my father. And you should too. So I want us to really talk about if you're worrying, where is your confidence? Point number one, is God your bottom line? You've heard this in business terms. What's the bottom line? What's the, what's the bottom line? What do I got to do? What's the absolute bottom line that has to happen to make this deal work? That means if, we don't, there's, if, you don't, if you're not willing to go where the person says this, then you're not, it's not going to happen. So my question is, is God your bottom line? That means nothing can stop you. Nothing can take you out. There's nothing before God. God is the end. God is the one that takes you. In death, you're safe with God. And let's look at First Kings, uh, excuse me, look at James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. And um, in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So this, once again, I love when we read scriptures because when you start to have faith in God's word, it actually says things that causes you to uh, uh, leave your human reason, so to speak. You still keep your mind, but look, it says in verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh, and I love the uh, NLT version because when we look at this, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, it doesn't mean you jump up and down when really challenging things can happen to you, but it does mean that you go, what is the lesson here? And now I'm, it's beneficial. Nothing's happening or excluded from God's sight. God loves me, so he's not going to let me fall or, or, or something to happen he's not aware of. He's allowed the situation to enter my arena of life, and now I need to consider it an opportunity for great joy, meaning with my faith, 
I'm going to be tested. It says in verse three, you know that when your faith is tested, God tests you because he loves you. He wants you to grow. And when you're tested in your faith, your endurance has a chance to grow. Endurance. It says it has a chance to grow. It also cannot have a chance to grow if you don't make the decisions by faith you need to make. God's patient, but only by faith can you please God. So let it grow in verse four, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect, complete, and not needing anything. That means that you're gonna get stronger and more mature spiritually where when challenges happen, you can see deeper into them and understand the spiritual reasons God's doing this. And it really is not about the here and now in the moment. It's about what is God doing? This is an amazing time. I'm gonna have a growth spurt spiritually. So are you ready? What, is God your bottom line or is something else your bottom line? You need to have God bottom line. Look in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. You know, to have endurance, it just doesn't happen naturally. Uh, endurance, the definition is, uh, it says, the power of enduring unpleasant or difficult, or difficult process or situation without giving up. Wow. Uh, the capacity of something to last or to withstand wear and tear. So it's enduring unpleasant circumstances and not quitting. And it says if you grow in that, there's a reason. And you will understand that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, pick it up with me here. Uh, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilgad said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the Lord said with his word, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in Kirith Ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Wow. Here we see Elijah. Uh, is the first in a long line of important prophets God sent to Israel and Judah uh, because there had not been any other kings that had stayed faithful through its history. Each king turned to be wicked, actually leading the people to worship foreign gods. They were supposed to lead the people closer to God. Uh, and few priests were left from the tribe of Levi. Most have gone to Juva, uh, Judah. And the priests appointed by Israel's kings were corrupt and ineffective. With no king or priest to bring God's word to the people, God called prophets to try to rescue Israel from moral and spiritual decline. For the next 300 years, these men and women would play vital roles in both nations, encouraging the people and leaders to turn back to God, to repent. And today, it's really not much different. Just because you say you're something doesn't mean you're something. If you say you're a Christian, then you need to understand you didn't decide that. You studied God's word and repented and made decisions to continue to learn to obey everything. So now you're gonna be uh, living and set your heart and mind on things above, not just for a temporary time in your life. You're gonna to strive to grow in your faith and endurance and live and see and breathe the way God calls you to do it. And you're gonna fall, you're gonna get back up. You're gonna go through challenging times, you're gonna see the glory of God in the challenging times and not quit. So we see here that Elijah comes in Ahab had become a wicked king. And 
Elijah's called by God. He goes right into the kingdom, walks right through him. He's like a mountain man, prophet, powerful, no other soldiers, walks right into the king and walks right up to the king. And in those days, if you approach the king without being invited, you, you, that's immediate death sentence. I think his faith and his presence was so powerful that I think it just everybody froze because you'll notice that no one got him. He left and then God said, now go into the Kirith Ravine because they're going to try to kill you. But no one stopped him when he was there. I think when you have faith, it gets people's attention, not because you're anything, because the presence of God is with you. And we see here that uh, when he does that, he goes up and says, listen up, king, the word of the Lord has come. And for the next few years, there's not going to be any rain. And God has now sentenced you because of your wickedness. And he walks out. And then God says, go. And he goes into a ravine, the Kirith Ravine. And this is pure desert out there. He's got nothing. And God says, go, and uh, you'll drink from the brook. You don't know where it is, but when you get there, there'll be one there. That's what he's saying. And I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. And then it says that the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. You know what a raven is? It's a big black bird. Ravens to this day are around castles. I went to London and then visited the, uh, the, the castle there, and I heard the history of it, and it's really amazing that ravens, even in England, they actually pay for the uh, veterinary care of the ravens because it's such rich history that these ravens, these black ravens, are, were just always around the, king, the kingdoms. But a black raven is not going to bring you, can't be trained to do tricks. It's not going to come or go get food for you or go chase a ball like a dog and bring it back. Do you understand that Elijah not only went into the king's palace and put his life at risk because he trusted God, he goes, if I die, I die, I'm going to do it. Then he went out to the desert after he did that and in the middle of the desert. And then God said, I will supply your food. And he had to wait, and he said the ravens in the morning brought his food, and in the evening. And I could just see, even in the uh, late afternoon, you could kind of sense that probably his stomach was starting to get little hunger pangs. And there's probably times where he'd be looking, not doubting God, but kind of looking in the future, looking in the, in the distance up in the air, and just trying to spot. And then eventually he'd see these little dots, and they'd come into focus, and they'd be ravens. And imagine these birds coming and bringing meat and bread to him. Totally content. What kind of meat was it? Wow. You know, it was probably some amazing meat that you can't even barbecue here. It was from God. So where are you when times get trust, when times get tough? Is God your bottom line or do you get to a point where you go, this ain't working out, God's not here, and then you start to search and look for something to save you or hold you together that's not God. And that's when it's easy to do that. It's easy to get fearful and not trust and not have faith when you're in an unusual situation. And this being in the desert without any provisions and any, he had no job, he had no money in the bank account and he had no camper. He had no food, he had no water, and God told him to go out deep in the desert and I'll bring it to you. Are you in the desert right now? Do you feel like you're deep, even in this pandemic? And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying hard times aren't gonna come to us, but if you are in God's kingdom and you are trusting God, then God and God's people, God will come through. You may need to suffer and you may need to have endurance because your faith may be tested right now. That's what it says. He's going to test your faith and, and through endurance, which means unpleasant things could happen. But you got to understand, don't be in the moment. Always realize God will never leave you, never forsake you. He promises that. So I hope you can be an Elijah. Be bold. Be not afraid to stand up against sin and speak for the Lord in love and respect, but share that God Almighty is who is reigning and he loves each person then trust 
that God will provide for you regardless of outside circumstances like Elijah did. Let's move on. Point number two, do you have a quitting point? Do you have a quitting point? I know if any of you have ever experienced starting something and quitting for no good reason, it doesn't feel good. And all of us probably have quit something that we just didn't care and we just quit and we knew, uh, you know, being a quitter, being nicknamed a quitter is not a good thing. Especially not because you're trying to prove something to somebody else, but when you quit because you don't want to push through, it's too hard for you and you want comfort, you're showing that there's going to be a lot of other situations that are going to stop you in your tracks and you're going to have a quitting point. So what's going to call you to overcome and go the distance and push through to become a successful human being, a mature human being, to grow through emotions, to forgive people that have hurt you from the past, to not let some painful thing that happened in the past stunt you, where you just continue to use that as a victim and excuses why you don't change. Let's pick it up in verse seven of 1 Kings chapter 17. So we're following Elijah, right? And now it says in verse seven, sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath and when he came to the town gate, a widow was gathering sticks. He called to her, and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That's a bleak, depressing outlook. Hope is gone. Let's pick it up in verse 13. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Now remember, Elijah is a prophet and Elijah speaks the words of God. And you know what? It's been said that in over 365 different places in the Bible, God says somehow in some way to not fear, don't be afraid, have courage. He probably knows that it's natural for us to be afraid or tempted to be, have fear. So we have it almost every day. We can just assume God's saying, do not be afraid. Because Elijah is a representative of God. He says, don't be afraid. And he says, go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Let's just finish that sentence again. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. My name is Chris Klopek. I'm a sinner that needs a lot of help and I'm in the Lord and I need grace every day. But I, just like Elijah right now, am speaking the word of the Lord to you. So it's not about the man, it's about the Bible correctly being spoken. So this is truth whether you are willing to have faith to believe it or not. So let's look this over a little bit. We see point number two, as I said, do you have a quitting point? Well, Elijah has already done some pretty powerful things. He went into a palace, walked through an army, stood up to the king, and told him, you've been sentenced. 
God's not going to reign on the land for three years because of your wickedness. And then goes. And he goes out into the desert without anything. He could have died out there of starvation. God brings him not only just something to barely, he didn't have to eat ants or crickets or roaches. He said, no, I'll bring you heavenly bread and some prime rib. How you doing? How do you like it, Elijah? And he brought it. And I'll bet that was good. And then I'll bring it to you in the evening too. And I'm not going to bring you too much because I don't want you to get fat and overweight. I want you, I'm going to bring it just when you start to get a little hungry so you can be so grateful for it. And I'm going to take care of you and you're going to drink from the brook. So he's like, yes, this is great. But then we picked it up right after the second point. Do you have a quitting point? The brook dries up because there's no rain. And, he, and, and Elijah said that. He goes, wait a minute. I, I actually said what you wanted me to say and this is affecting me. But then in verse 8, you got to see in the Bible, the word of the Lord came to him. And that's what you'll see a lot of the times. And that's what the Bible's here for. The word of the Lord wants to come to you. He says, go at once to Zarephath. Now, he doesn't say think about it. Let me persuade you. He understands. See, when one becomes a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, they make him Lord. That means they've already counted the cost. And they're not going to like, they, they've already decided they're going to trust God with their life. So when God orders the relationship, we understand that we, God is God and we are not, so God can give us commands and we're not, it's not about bargaining anymore, it's about praying and growing and being strong in the faith and encouraging each other. He says, go. And he says, I've already arranged it. Okay, well, thank you. I, can you, you didn't tell me. Uh, and, and he goes to, in the, in the region of Sidon, so he even tells him to go out of the area of Israel and into an ungodly area and it says, uh, you're going to Sarapath in the region of Sidon. This is outside of the Jewish people. So now he's going for sure into a land that people don't believe in the God of heaven. And he goes, I'm sending you to a widow with a son. That's the last person that you would think could help you back then in those days. In those days, in those times, a widow was considered one of the worst positions to be in. Because there was, they needed protection, and the, because the man was usually stronger, they were helpless, and they were helpless against uh, marauders, bandits. So he says, I'm going to give you a, a widow and, and, the, and her son. Th that's not very comforting unless you understand God is never going to fail you. The Word of God never fails. So he gets out there, and he goes up to this lady, and you already see she's in terrible position. So Elijah could even start second guessing, like, God, is this a good idea? This seems worse. Because I went out, and it was all good when the food and bread and the drink was coming, and then the brook dried up, and now you told me to go like 200 miles, I think it is, if you look at the research, way out farther, 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 way out of way from I'm, I'm familiar with, and now I'm completely out of the area where if there's anybody left, there's not going to be anybody in this area that loves me or, or that loves you or even knows you. That's the point. That's the point. So he goes up to this widow, and he says, would you bring me water in a jar? She, he already sees she's struggling. And then as she starts to walk, I can hear, and I could see it on her face. If you picture this, would you bring me a little jar of water that I may have a drink? And then as she's going to get it, he calls. And so her back's to him. But imagine her hearing this. And bring me, please, a piece of bread. And then here's where she goes, as surely as the Lord, your God. Now notice it's not her God. Your God, all right, Mr. Prophet, lives. I don't have any bread. I got nothing. And I'm already planning on dying. I even stopped thinking there's a second game plan. I'm quitting. There's nowhere to go. I'm done. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm going to gather the few little sticks I found and take them home and make a meal for myself and my son so we may eat it. And then there's a little slash that says, and die. It's over. I'm going to enjoy one last miserable moment with my son, and I've already been depressed and worried and frozen with anxiety, and now we're going to die together. And you want some bread? Get it yourself. That's what, he could, that's what she could have felt like. But look. Look how God works through and God speaks. Because remember, 
we have the Bible now written down and we can see God's love. But look what he says here in verse 13. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Doesn't say, listen up, lady. I'm a prophet of God. You better trust God. No. He says, don't be afraid. Go home. Do as you've said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. And then he doesn't say, because I'm someone special. He says, I'm not even here on my own deal. I wouldn't even know about you, lady, except the God I'm going to introduce you to. I've been going through persevering and enduring and having my faith tested and I'm tested. And as I go, God's using me and you're just on the journey and I'm a servant of God. So guess what? In verse 14, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. So once again, he reiterates it that, listen, this is God almighty here now. He may not have been here for you, but you need to grab some faith, lady. That's not over. And he says here, the God of Israel says, the jar of oil will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain. She went away and obeyed. She did as Elijah told her. What happened through her faith in obedience? See, consider trials of many kind an opportunity for joy. Because you know God is testing your faith and giving your endurance a chance to grow. So this lady had the first chance because she never really heard about the God of Israel. And he said, don't be afraid. God, who you may have heard of, but he's here. And if you put me first, you put God first. I'm a representative of God. I believe me, I don't feel comfortable as a man, just a human man going, hey, widow and little kid, you're starving, but give me the last of your food first. That would be hard to do. That would be hard to obey. But I know God is working, so he's putting me in a position which I don't really feel comfortable asking a widow that's starving for the, the last bit of her food, but I know God is never capable of making a mistake. So that's why I'm telling you, this is a trust test issue. Instead of you going home and making the little scrap of bread you think you're gonna have, which that's all you would have if you're on your own and you're gonna die. I'm telling you to step out in faith and give me up everything you have. Give me everything you have. Give it all up for God. And watch, God says if you do that, you're gonna have more than enough. And that's what happens. She went away and obeyed him, that's faith. And then there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up until the jug, and the jug of oil did not run dry until, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. In keeping with the word of the Lord. How well do you know your Bible? How excited are you to read your word every day and go, whoa, promises, wow. Point number three. Is the next problem your opportunity or your doom? Let's pick it up in verse 17. So she's fired up. Wow, this God of yours is seriously amazing. We are eating well. This is great. You can stay here as long as you want, Elijah. But in verse 17, it says, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God. Have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord. God, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him, please. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him. And he lived. 
So Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. So let's just check this out. Do you think God sent more problems at this widow because he just wanted to see how much she could take? No. He knew even though she was grateful and she took a step of faith, it wouldn't have been enough for her to, to stay faithful. He had to bring another opportunity for great joy, another problem, another trial, for an opportunity for her to have great joy. First, great misery because she's doubting. See, when you doubt and you start to lose your faith and it turns to fear, great misery. But when you look at the trial or the next problem coming your way and you know God has sent it or allowed it to come, it's another opportunity for joy. See, the reason this happened is she needed to be tested. The Lord tested her faith and gave her a chance to grow in her endurance and not quit. And we see she did struggle and we all struggle. That's fine. God says the struggle is the process. The struggle is the, where the joy is uh, because now you're growing in faith that's worth more than gold. And when her son dies, she says in 18, we see her, she's struggling. Her faith is going. First, you know, first in verse 16, she says, wow, this is amazing. The Lord, the Lord made it happen. And then we see her son uh, in verse 17 gets worse and worse and finally stops breathing. So it was a slow death. It was very painful. Son got ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. You know how hard it is to watch a child or even anyone that you love suffer and get worse and worse and still suffer and then stop breathing. That's not only really painful to the person dying, that's painful for the person around them. So God did that why? To hurt her? No. To really drive her to the bottom line. God. To not quit. But she screams out, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin? And kill my son? So now she expresses that she does have sin. She goes, so there's something on her heart. Did you want to remind me of my sin? So there's something, we don't know what it was, but her heart was prompted to realize she needed to get right with God. There was a problem. Did you come here to remind me of my sin? We don't know what the sin is, but there's sin. And then she says, you killed my son. And Elijah doesn't say, you're a sinner and you deserve it and you cause it. No, he says, give me it. And even Elijah is growing also. See, God works in all situations. He's out there, and he even cries out to the Lord, but he doesn't quit. He says, he even says, he cries to the Lord because it would have been so sad to watch and see this woman weeping and watching this boy die. And so he carried, and he didn't know that God had this prepared. So he had to grab her, and he was the one that God was using. So he had to just trust. He carried her up, carried him up, and he stretches over him. Many say when he stretches over him, he was just trying to get his body, the circulation and the blood going and just, but he was praying when he was doing that. And he was crying out to the, uh, he, 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 he stretched himself over the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Let this life, boy's life return to him. And he lived. Elijah picked the boy up, brought him down. And then we see the test of faith that it was painful. It wasn't pleasant, but this widow's solid now. Because she says, now I know that you are a man of God, in verse 24, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. See, when you're convinced something's truth, even when serious, sad circumstances come, it doesn't matter. You don't look at the problem, you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. That's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Even when God has done a miracle in our lives, more testing may come. 
and more faith may be needed. The famine was devastating to the faithful widow and her son, but losing her son was far worse. We can rejoice when God provides, but we must continue to depend on him as we face each new trial. Because that's why I'm saying, do you have a quitting point? And let's look at James chapter 5, verse 16, because we see Elijah, and I don't know where you're at, but I know if you're a true disciple, then you are going to God in prayer, not only once, but throughout the day. You've learned more and more to trust and, and continue to go to him and wrestle and cry, and, but not give up. And look what it says in verse 17 of chapter 5. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and the sky sent down rain, and the earth began, uh, began to yield its crops. See, Elijah was a human just as we are, but the reason God worked through him because he had great faith. He didn't freak out. He didn't stop giving contribution or even our mission's special contribution for evangelizing the world. See, God's truth is still saying God wants all people to be saved. He says, go make disciples of all nations. And we are a worldwide movement of international Christian churches that plant churches and continue to build churches. And we are going to assist and serve God in faith to be used by him to really bring the word of truth to every man and woman on the planet in faith. So right now, the coronavirus is a great temptation to say, I don't see anything happening, get afraid. Many people, I want to really commend, some people have already said they got their stimulus checks and God has already let them keep their jobs. They are grateful to give to our missions contribution that we're trying to collect by June 30th to do our part in Orlando as all the other first world churches are doing to continue to help sustain and keep the churches going and keep the truth going that God called us to do because that's truth. So no matter what happens, are you going to quit? And it says here in verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. It doesn't say the prayer of everyone has earnest has great power. It says the prayer of a righteous person. A righteous person is someone who's confessing their sins, staying in the light, and striving to obey God. That's a righteous person. So if you're, if there's no secrets, you're only as sick as your secrets, and you're still continuing to bring your sin and ask God to change and obey God, doesn't matter if you fall, doesn't matter if you fail, but you get back up and go, God Almighty, you are my God, forgive me. That's a righteous person. So your prayers are powerful and will have wonderful results. If you're deliberately sinning and you just play 911 with God and you don't, you aren't willing to step out on faith and sacrifice and take risks and trust God's word to accomplish his will, well, I think it'd be the opposite. If you're not righteous, then your prayers aren't going to work because God doesn't answer unrighteous prayers because that would mislead you. And don't be thinking because you got a great job and a lot of money in the bank that you're righteous. That's a deception that even the Jewish people thought. It's being right with God. There's nothing more precious than treasure in heaven and his commands lead to eternal life. So I just want to encourage you guys here that are you all set for life? If you're a disciple, you are. And you are going to continue every day in your quiet times as you go to God and ask for strength. You're going to set your heart and your mind on things above. Is God your bottom line? Well, as tests come and as problems prove to be real, you will trust God's word. You will cling to the truth. You will use the encouragement of the family of God, which is the church. And you will see that God, nothing is going to separate you from God. Do you have a quitting point? Let's just say, wow, I didn't sign up for this. This is terrible. I had this and that and this and that already happened to me. You're keeping a record of wrongs. No, if God's allowing challenges to come into your life, there's something you need to be going, what am I supposed to learn? 
What am I missing here? And maybe you're actually going to need to quit and be exposed and then he can help you repent. It's all for your good. And then the final point is, is the next problem your opportunity or doom? See, don't get me wrong, challenges can come and I can go, oh, oh. and then I gotta put my spiritual brain on together and go, I gotta set my heart on mine, on things above and go, God, I know right now he's a human being. I'm like, oh my gosh. But then I just pray. I don't know how you're gonna do it. I don't know if there's gonna be ravens bringing me meat, but I know you can do it. And then, my problem and my next problem is an opportunity to grow in my faith. Guys, let's really understand no matter what's going on around you, God is God. Truth of God's word is truth. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Everything and every answer in God's will is yes because victory is in Jesus and to God be the glory. Faith has great.